one for Grand Rounds after our summer hiatus. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the year, a friend and a colleague, Dr. Melissa Wong. Um, Dr. Wong and I actually started at Cedars together 10 years ago, actually this week. It was right after Labor Day in 2012. Oh, uh, she completed her residency at the University of Chicago, and then she's done a ton since she came here at Cedars. Uh, she spent four to five years building an amazing foundation with the medical group. Then she completed her MFM fellowship. During this time, she also completed the Cedar sinai Masters in Health Delivery Science, the Cedar sinai uh, Medical Staff Leadership Development Program, and the UCLA Medical Education Fellowship. And she also previously served as an Associate Residency uh, Program Director, so definitely an overachiever here. Uh, her commitment to education is unmatched. She was awarded the resident teaching award at the University of Chicago all four years as a resident. She's been awarded the Cedar sinai Golden Apple Faculty Teaching Award three times, the AFCO Excellence in Teaching Award twice, and the Cedar sinai OBGYN Graduate Graduating Teaching Fellow Award once. She's published numerous publications and abstracts, and so it's an honor to introduce her today, and she will be speaking about operative deliveries. Go for it, Melissa. Goodness. That was fantastic, Erica. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So thank you, everybody, um, for the privilege of speaking on a topic really close to my heart, um, operative delivery. Uh, so make sure we're working here. I have no disclosures, financial, emotional, or otherwise, hence driving a minivan. But my objectives, these are sort of the stated objectives as they're supposed to sound, lots of action verbs. But for simplicity's sake, it really is going to come down to this. Uh, where are we in terms of operative delivery in the US? Where should we be? Um, so what are some of the benefits and how do we choose the ideal candidates to reap the greatest benefits while minimizing the acknowledged risks? And then last, my second favorite thing to talk about after vampire non-binary TV shows, resident education and training. So without further ado, let's get started. So this graph represents basically the proportion of non-vaginal deliveries in the last two and a half decades. So the birth rate has remained really similar, although a little bit of a decline in 2020. What has changed certainly are exit strategies for babies. So while the fall in operative deliveries is not the only reason for the shift, C-section rates have really undeniably gone up. And in particular, while operative delivery represented about 10% of all births back in 1990, it now represents closer to about 3% of all births. And then focusing on the most recent data that we have, this is from the recent National Vital Statistics System data on operative delivery. In 2019, there were a total of 3.7 million births. Um, and as you can see here, for the particular distributions among operative deliveries, we can see that um, both are becoming more rare, but vacuum um, nearly four times as common as forceps, which is only about one in 200 deliveries. So you might ask yourself, um, who cares? Why have such a commitment to operative delivery? Well, I think operative delivery really represents sort of the potential for preventive care, in this case, preventing C-section. So in the OB care consensus document by ACOG and SMFM highlighting the safe prevention of primary cesarean delivery, they noted these were the most common causes in order. And of note, the two most common causes among these, arrest and indeterminate fetal heart rate, are the type that have the potential to be resolved with operative delivery rather than a C-section. So you might ask yourself then, why avoid C-section so much? Well, there's a few different reasons. Cesarean delivery um, leads to more severe maternal morbidities. Um, so this is a retrospective study from Lou et al. in the Canadian Medical Journal. Um, and they looked at basically all of their deliveries from 91 to 2005, and they compared planned cesarean delivery, which was sort of the most benign version you can get, right? It was, you had to have a breach presentation and no labor diagnosis goes. So these are the like schedule at lunch, pop over a cut and be back in the office versus planned vaginal delivery, which could have ended any which way. So some of those were C-sections as well. And what you find in looking at this is severe maternal morbidity rates are three times as common 2.7 versus 0.9%, or put another way, among even this lowest risk group, one in 36 are gonna have one of those severe maternal morbidities. There's also risk, of course, with subsequent C-sections. So as all the residents on the call uh, love to pimp one another uh, about the risk of C-section, or accreta goes up significantly, even by just the four C-section alone, not having a previa present, your risk is dialed up to about 2%. But of course, with a previa, that risk uh, increases exponentially. Cesarean deliveries also lead to more cesarean deliveries, or CBACs, as I like to call them. 
Um, so about 13, per, uh, our, our VBAC rate in the United States is 13%. So despite all of our sort of counseling and calculators and all of the, you know, all of the things we can do, the reality is that 87% of the time, your next birth is going to be a C-section if you've had one C-section. And this is really despite the fact that operative delivery um, can be, oh, I'm sorry, despite the fact that it can be a way to decrease C-section, it is still really rare. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, number one is failure. Right, so the likelihood of a successful delivery with a cesarean is close to 100%. Um, and we really like that. We like to be successful. Second, neonatal morbidity. So I would actually make the case, though, that whenever you choose the right control group, operative delivery is at least as, if not more, safe than converting to a cesarean delivery. And the last one is really the sort of provider inexperience. And this is a legitimate problem, but I think we can fix that. And it's, in fact, the reason that I called this talk Quo Vadis, not because I like the Apocryphal Acts of Peter or this 1951 film, although I do like superlatives, so most colossal ever, he pretty much got me. But I do think that we really stand at a crossroads for operative delivery, that if we continue to make it less and less of our practice, we continue to decrease our own comfort with it such that we're less likely to infuse resident comfort in it, we're just going to see the numbers go down, and this frequency declines, probably success with it is going to fail too. We continue this trend. Operative delivery has the potential to go the way of other brilliant inventions nobody uses, like clap on lights. So before we get too deep into where we're going, then where did we come from? And for this, we'll take a little segue. So the history of forceps is one of the more fascinating in medicine. They were invented by the Chamberlain Sons in the 1600s, and they were so sort of secretive about the IP on this that they actually would, before they entered the room, have the uh, woman patient be blindfolded bring in this gilded chest to make all of these sort of clanging sounds, deliver the baby, and then put everything away before they then unblindfolded um, the patient. They were in fact handed down generation after generation until a couple centuries later, the secret was eventually sold. Uh, this is actually a really cool book about it, not sponsored, um, if anybody's interested. So vacuum on the other hand is actually described also as early as the 1700s, but it was really hard to get good suction with the tools at the time. And one of the first really effective ones was developed by Simpson, Simpson is the forceps, and based on the breast pump. It wasn't really until the 80s that um, we saw um, significant use of it with the advent of better instruments. All right, end of segue. So then we're gonna go through sort of the um, choosing a candidate, um, and we'll go through where there are indications for an operative delivery, contraindications, prerequisites, as well as predictors of success. So a lot of this is gonna come from the ACOG practice bulletin and as stated by them, um, the indications really are the same regardless of which instrument you use. So kind of break it down to fetal benefit, so non-reassuring tracing, indeterminate fetal heart rate. Maternal benefit, I sort of break down into can't push, so myasthenia gravis, spinal cord injuries, or shouldn't push, so things like cardiac or neurologic disease where there are contraindications to Valsalva. And the prolonged second stage thing actually is one of the few things that's undergone a change in recent um, practice bulletins where instead of having this sort of two, I'm um, sorry, one, two, two, three um, of time to push based on your parity and epidural use, um, they now don't actually specify, but based on the safe prevention document, two, three, three, four, um, again, depending on those other factors. So what are the absolute contraindications to an operative delivery? Um, the reality is the true contraindications are relatively few. Um, so from a fetal standpoint, it's things like demineralizing diseases, osteogenesis imperfecta, or um, bleeding disorder. So hemophilia is one of them. And then also things where they might be predisposed to thrombocytopenia. The reality is even in moms though with severe ITP, less than 20K, um, neonatal ITP will actually only occur in fewer than 5% of them. Nonetheless, though, I'd say if you have severe ITP, it's reasonable to avoid an operative delivery. And if you're going to do it, have it be forceps um, over vacuum. Second would be the fetal position being unknown, which I think of as personally more of a prerequisite, but ACOG lists it three times in their practice bulletin as a contraindication, so I figured it's worth listing here. And then last, a vacuum, less than 34 um, weeks specifically. The reason is because there's a higher risk for intraventricular hemorrhage in this already high risk group, so 7% at 34 weeks, and as high as 30% at 30 weeks. And remembering that this is an age thing, not a weight thing, right, as it reflects mineralization of the bones. But then again, a lot has also even changed from the old ACOG practice bullet in 1994 to 2020. One of these was that the vacuum sort of prohibition got a lot softer. So many things have changed since 1994. So back then they said, 
it was inappropriate in pregnancies before 34 weeks of gestation because of the risk, whereas now it's really been much more hedged. So has been discouraged for gestational age less than 34 weeks. So how about an upper limit to size? So this is the most commonly cited study, which is why I bring it up here. It was at a UCSF, a retrospective database of 2,900 um, macrosomic infants versus 16,000 normal weight and looking at the likelihood of birth injury. So the absolute risk of an injury with forceps was 5.7%, although importantly, only 1.5% persisted, and with vacuum was 2.2%, um, both of which were relatively increased compared to the referent of primary C-section. So then should we cut everybody? Well, this is also the one that gets commonly cited for number needed to treat. So this is the number needed to treat with C-section to avoid an injury um, in macrosomic uh, babies would be 258. So that is a lot of C-sections. Um, understanding the limits of our ultrasound estimation and whatnot, and the infrequency of these injuries even persisting. And then as far as um, this next study, I'm actually going to spend a little bit longer on it, mainly because it's one of our largest studies looking at this, and it's local, looking at a database of 568,000 births, of which 175,000 um, were greater than 3,500 grams. And this study is interesting because it really looks at two compounding effects. Hi, Colin User of two known risk factors for shoulder dystocia, i.e. diabetes and operative delivery. And so I'm going to orient you to this graph here. So every baby on this graph is macrosomic, and the y-axis is the percent probability of having a shoulder dystocia. So we'll start here with the black line. So this is kind of our baseline, our control. These are unassisted, uh, no operative delivery, and no diabetes, right? This is just what's going to happen, your probability of having a shoulder um, in the setting of macrosomia. The orange lines when we add in one risk factor, i.e. an assisted birth. So we know that, not surprisingly, this increases your risk of shoulder, right? You have said to the vagina, I know better than you, and you pull out the head, um, but the shoulders there are waiting behind. And then the red line um, up here is whenever you have two risk factors. So an assisted delivery in a diabetic patient, and again, not surprisingly, you compound increasing the risk for shoulder. And the gray this line- forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Hey, Eleanor. <laughs> Three, two, Three, the four, gray line I put up here is a population eight, five, four, seven is not available. Eleanor, you shouldn't leave a no, message. Please record here. your message. When you've finished recording, you may hang up or press one for more. Awesome. Um, so the gray line I put up here is actually a population not per se pertinent to operative delivery, but it's meaningful to me because these are diabetic patients. And the relevant dot again to me is this one. And why? Because this is our EFW of 4,500 in a diabetic patient, which is sort of the EFW, as we all know, that ACOG, by committee opinion, not RCTs, recommends um, considering a cesarean delivery. So if this risk, which in this study was 19.9%, is that at which brachial plexus palsy risk is sort of high enough that a cesarean is recommended by ACOG, if that's the case, should we then extrapolate that line and say the risks of assisting in a greater than 4,200 gram diabetic or a greater than 4,500 gram non-diabetic are likewise too high. Should we not risk operative delivery at this level? There's really no clear guidance from ACOG on this, um, but I would love to hear uh, folks' thoughts in the chat or comments. And then the flip side of weight, there is no lower limit, um, though with vacuum, if you have zero idea of the gestational age, then they recommend airing to avoid it less than 2,500 grams since that's about the size of a 34 weeker. And this of note does not apply to forceps, which have always been perceived as protective from, I guess, the vagina. And then finally, last, I'll highlight just because ACOG does again, non-reassuring fetal status is certainly not a contraindication. And in one study in which they somehow got 1,400 pregnant persons to consent to elective vacuums, there were no differences in cord blood gas pH or neonatal morbidity. So now that we have the contraindications out of the way, let's talk prerequisites. And certainly one easy way to think about this is a checklist. And this was the checklist published by SMFM in 2020. And as you can see, it is super practical and usable because really if in MFM, there's one thing that we hear all the time is great note, but could you make it longer? So same idea with checklists. So while that one's great, I really think about it a lot simpler. Um, so I think about the stuff that I'm thinking about at the nursing station. And I really break this down into mom being ready. So the pelvis is adequate as judged as slash documented. The cervix is 10 centimeters in rupture of membranes. And then um, that the baby's ready so that the estimated fetal weight um, is on the chart and that some, some degree of position is known. 
And I'm also going to take a little segue here about position because uh, long and short of it is we are not great at it. So whether you are comparing us by digital examination as attendings and using as your gold standard ultrasound, or even in the case of CHU, what they visually looked at when they were sort of immediately after delivery, we're wrong a good quarter of the time. But the good news is it can be taught. So this last study actually by Ramphill, it was a totally inexperienced novice who was incorrect 42% of the time, probably because they didn't know to say OA, OA every time. But if you briefly taught them how to do an ultrasound, they were only wrong about 13% of the time. So this is actually a really teachable skill. And doing the ultrasound is pretty simple. As you can see here, step one, turn your back to the patient and stop looking at the ultrasound screen. These jokes are really hard at WebEx, anyway. Uh, but in actuality, it's actually really hard to find a picture of the probe transverse. And that's what's important here. The probe should be transverse um, on the abdomen. So you go transverse, and then these are examples of what you'll potentially see. And for those interested in taking a deeper dive on this, this is actually a fantastic article by Federica Belusi, where she not only describes um, what to do and how to place the probe, but has these really nice graphics that are sort of coupled um, with these illustrations um, about what you'll actually see on your ultrasound. So really nice one. So coming back then to the rest of what you remember in the room, um, just an engaged head, usually greater than uh, plus two. And then in the room, it's uh, this mnemonic is sort of one that goes around a lot, the ABCs. So A is assistance. So this is not something that you're uh, doing by yourself at home. This is something where you have peds aware, you have your charge nurse aware, anesthesia aware because of the possible conversion. Um, the patient should have some degree of anesthesia. And then also this they call address the patient, which I feel like doesn't really give it adequate credit of that. Yeah, there should be consent. Things that are not consent, uh, I'm going to help the baby out a little or um, I'm just going to pull the baby down here. So it really should be a proper consent. And I'll tell you that I actually probably bring up considering an operative delivery two to three times as much as I actually pull. That way the patient sort of feels like they've got time to ask questions, that we tried harder to make a vaginal delivery happen. By the time we actually get to the point of considering the operative delivery, it becomes more of a true shared decision making. The bladder should be empty. Um, and cesarean preparation should be in place. And this is really critical because if there's actually one point that I'd like to get across here today, it's that if you have failed an operative delivery, we do not resume pushing, right? So if we fail, we go to a cesarean delivery. And why? Well, one sort of philosophically, right? You signed up to do an operative delivery. Presumptively, there was some need to expedite this delivery occurring. And so we don't then resume pushing for half an hour. And then second, the side effects, the most sort of terrifying of which is something like a subgaleal, um, those are incurred basically immediately when you start the operative delivery. Um, and so you can lose the entire blood volume of a baby um, in the course of 10 minutes with a se severe subgaleal hemorrhage. So you don't know that that has or hasn't happened whenever you start the operative delivery. And so predicting success. So the greatest predictor of success is a tough thing. It's a little bit of a joke, but the reality is failed operative delivery is actually really rare, right? So this is a Cochrane review that goes through the nitty gritty of choice and instrument and relation to likelihood of success, maternal and neonatal outcomes. And what they, you see is that the likelihood of success with forceps is higher. Um, they're 35% less likely to fail, but ultimately the success is high for either of them. So then how do we actually choose the patients themselves? What might put one at higher risk for failure? So this is a retrospective case control study um, over 10 years of all deliveries in Washington state. And what they found really increased risk of failure pretty much mirrors what we think of as increasing the cesarean delivery rate. So older age, um, obese, uh, obesity, um, diabetes with it increased further for a pregestational diabetic, um, black race um, or macrosomia. And then this is a more recent study and from the Green Journal, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on this because I think it's a really good one. So this is a big retrospective um, cohort UK study of 22,000 uh, women giving having term singleton vertex, so kind of NTSV-ish in the UK from 2008 to 2012. These are sort of the overall outcomes of the deliveries and study period. So they had 22,000 women again to start, and each of these percentages is going to be of the total population. So 20%, I'm sorry, 20,000 of them, or 89%, made it to the second stage. Another 10% fell out um, into uh, the first stage for C-section. 
of those 20,000, 16,000 or 70% had an unassisted vaginal delivery. Another 550 went to a C-section in the second stage or again, 2% of the total population. For the rest then, 17% um, um, underwent a, or 3,800, underwent an attempt at an operative delivery and successful operative deliveries accounted for 15.6% of the total population or sort of making that math a little easier 93% success rate for operative delivery when it was attempted or smushing that all together with judicious use of an operative delivery they were able to achieve a c-section rate of 13.8% many of which were in the first stage looking then at their case control regression analysis where did they differ well, the unsuccessful attempts had higher birth weight again, um, or spent a longer time fully dilated. Also of note, there was no relation to the OB, the degree of experience, um, or the time of day for the uh, pessimistic among us. So this is one of our most recent studies and using United States data on the topic, and it was done out of Northwestern. So it was a case control study of 4,300 patients with overall, again, about a 95% success rate of operative uh, vaginal delivery. And it's in the Midwest, which is where I train, where they lean a little bit forceps to vacuum equals slash slightly forceps. And so what they found in terms of predictors of failure was before you ever walked in, being oliparous, white, having a higher gestational age or EFW, predicted failure. And then intrapartum, basically indications that you might be less low or OP um, were likewise associated. So then with all of this cohort data out there, Cochrane sought to ask the question, okay, are there differing outcomes? Can we actually really predict those? And I include this slide mainly to suggest that if you would ever like to have your name on a Cochrane review, first go find data for which there, um, find questions for which there is no data, uh, and then write the shortest Cochrane review ever. So PSA. So really at the end of the day, um, we don't have uh, Cochrane, you know, we don't have RCTs, so, um, what can we do? We can sort of consolidate it all and say that probable predictors of failure are higher birth weight or EFW, um, and probably some degree of being less low or being um, OP or needing to rotate. So every decision should really be that, a decision. So the patient with a 4,500 gram baby who tried to push for five hours and is still OT, probably not a good idea to ride on those high effectiveness coattails. But on the other hand, somebody who's just exhausted from a two day induction for preeclampsia and is so darn close, you can consider it because Really, again, the greatest predictor of success is trying. And our success rates, sort of in a funny way, um, are actually getting a little bit higher because we are, I think, getting more selective about how we choose. And it's also possible that in the future we'll have better guidance with ultrasounds and algorithms. So there have been several studies in the last few years that have come out looking not at just the position um, by ultrasound, but actually evaluating probability of success using characteristics like head to perineum distance or the angle of progression. See, these are not quite ready for prime time, but I think it's something to pay attention to. And then before we quite move on, a word on mid pelvic de deliveries, or honestly, what I thought when I saw this study come out a couple of years ago, are we still talking about these? Um, and the answer is yes. So this was a study done out of Canada where they're actually still doing quite a few of these mid-station um, deliveries. Uh, and it turns out, uh, yep, still pretty darn risky. Um, and you can see here for both mom and for baby in terms of um, mid-cavity deliveries, and especially when you get sequential. Uh, so yeah, better not. Which actually um, serves as a nice segue into then the risks of operative delivery. So I sort of break down the risk of operative delivery into the somewhat separate but really overlapping ones of pain, uh, lacerations, and incontinence. So starting then with pain, there was previously not that much data on this, and it was none, in fact, prior to 2015, but this was a study done out of Norway using their registry data, and they had a nice 72% response rate. And of those who did respond, 904 of them um, had pelvic pain. And when you stratified it by mode of delivery, they found that sort of Baseline pain after a vaginal delivery um, was 4.5%. And comparatively, more women with an operative delivery um, had pain, 6.5%, uh, and more than with uh, the cesarean deliveries. Also of note, though, in the study, the actual biggest predictor um, was having a previous history of pelvic pain before delivery. And it's also reassuring that actually, if you dig down into the article, they resurveyed these patients at 7 to 18 months, and for 99% of them, um, their pelvic pain had resolved. 
And then looking um, next to laceration. So I'm going to start with actually some local data um, since it's from our own uh, Dr. Gregory is a part of the Consortium on Safe Labor. So this was a retrospectively um, collected mother-child linked EHR data from 19 hospitals, including Cedars. And they looked at sort of uh, the vertex greater than 34 weeks, not quite NTSD population, but um, vertex greater than 34. They excluded shoulders since that was known to be an independent risk factor for these lacerations and episiotomy. The total study population was 71,000 uh, women of whom 2.9% had sphincter injuries and 0.8% had uh, cervical injuries. So starting then with the sphincter injuries, in addition to being Asian, sorry, 14% of California's population, but um, it was also a risk factor um, to have an operative delivery. But incidentally, the risk was actually only statistically significant for nullips um, than, uh, rather than for multips and macrosomia and prolonged second stage, unsurprisingly. And then I bring this one up because I feel like we don't talk about it as much, but cervical lacerations are thankfully much rarer, um, we'll about one in 200 again. Um, but one of those laceration risks is actually an operative delivery, specifically a vacuum um, in a multiparous patient. And so after a vacuum, then be sort of really extra careful about making sure you inspect the cervix. And then on to incontinence. So this is actually a study that they kind of keep publishing out of. And it was done at Johns Hopkins, the mother's outcomes after delivery study. And basically they recruited patients five to 10 years after the birth of their first child. So it's a definition that could have had to be there were 8,200 patients that were eligible and they were able to get hold of about 2,500 of them. So their response rate is about 40%, not awesome, but here we are. They were about 60, 40 of note also in terms of forceps versus vacuum delivery. So actually fairly um, even split. And everybody got a standardized questionnaire and then actually also a gynecologic exam with a pop Q. The referent for all of these is the primary C-section. So the totally unbothered pelvis without labor. And what you can see here is that their overall stress urinary and anal incontinence rates um, were about 11% and for prolapse were about 7%, and that there was a higher likelihood with vaginal delivery or with any operative delivery. That said, part of the thing I don't like about the study is that they don't actually share if those differed from, again, spontaneous delivery to operative delivery. I suspect when they don't comment on it that it's because they weren't significant, especially with these wide confidence intervals. And this is actually that same group, a subsequent study, um, published uh, with a longer timeline now present. And the results over time actually do suggest differences here. So I'm going to orient you to the lines. So the C-section lines are in orange and not surprisingly, um, the C-section line pretty consistently is down there at the bottom, demonstrating some degree of pelvic floor protection, if you will. Um, and stress urinary incontinence and overactive bladder, um, AI, the less fun version, anal incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, all of these do seem to be um, increased, especially for SUI and operative, I'm sorry, an overactive bladder for vaginal delivery. But operative may also increase your um, probability of anal incontinence and prolapse even beyond the uh, normal delivery group. That said, I always take these with a little bit of a healthy grain of salt. They actually didn't have hospital records um, for these patients. Um, and another recent study they just published showed that the presence of pelvic dis floor dysfunction then bias their maternal recall of OB events for those who, for whom they did have the actual records. So kind of interesting. And then last on incontinence, this I really like, you know, it's kind of an older study, but it's fun because they basically just went around like surveying folks if they needed a new roof or if they had pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, so they went to 4,400 house, uh, the roof part is a joke. Um, they went to 4,400 households um, with 3,000 um, interviews. And they included, importantly, the never pregnant patients. And so this gives us a real sense for the baseline population, C-section and vaginally delivered. And I would make the case that if you sort of look through this, the reality for where a line exists to me is the positive pregnancy test or the sort of being Paris um, at this point. So the differences then um, beyond that are less. And their conclusions did reflect this. They did comment that there was more dysfunction with operative versus C-section, but didn't actually state it was different from when you just had a vaginal delivery versus an operative. So in summary, um, I'd pain, I'd say maybe, but a small absolute increase in 99% result. Lacerations, probably these are worse compared to a, non, a normal delivery. Um, and then for incontinence, again, probably the big differentiator is being pregnant um, or having a vaginal delivery period. So what about in terms of actually reducing some of these risks? 
Um, so one thing that sort of goes uh, in and out of fashion um, is episiotomy. And I would say it probably should still stay out of fashion. But one of the points that they make in this um, article is that we've never been able to show a benefit um, with cutting in a piece for an operative delivery. But part of the issue with doing that is we always lump force ups and vacuum together. Um, and we also lump medial lateral and median together. So what they did in this study was really just get all of the individual patient data for vacuum and medial lateral episiotomy. And what they were able to show was that actually there was a reduction in nullips um, for vacuum deliveries with a medial lateral, um, which in uh, mashing all of these two together, um, cut it down by half. Although importantly, actually, they did do a subgroup analysis where they looked at whether doing an episiotomy was sort of common practice where they were, and they found that it was actually only significant for those um, for which an episiotomy was fairly common. Another new question of late is whether antibiotics um, should be used when undergoing an operative vaginal delivery, and this was kind of the um, piece to resist onset SMFM a couple of years ago. And this was the ANODE trial. It was performed also in the UK, a randomized control trial for women undergoing an operative delivery. And their primary goal was reduction, it's kind of a weird one, in confirmed or suspected infection um, or post-operative pain and complications. And so what they did was they um, randomized folks to receiving either a gram of, I'm sorry, 500 milligrams of Augmentin one time. And what they found was that they did reduce um, the probability of having one of these outcomes from 19 to 11%, as well as reducing the need for pain relief and for um, wound break breakdown. There are really big differences though here because the population, um, you'll know if you look, sort of go to the table one, two thirds of them underwent a forceps delivery, which I'd say is pretty different from what happens in the US. And 90% of the time they were cutting episiotomies on this, these patients. So ACOG sort of takes an intermediate stance on it and says, sure, if you're cutting an episiotomy and doing a forceps delivery because that mirrors this population closely, um, then maybe consider uh, antibiotics in those cases. And then last, which I feel like never really gets talked about um, until these last couple of studies, um, was the potential benefit of operative delivery compared to a C-section. So there's plenty known of benefits of normal delivery over a C-section. But in recent years, these two studies came out, first focusing on this MFMU study. It was a sub-analysis of prospectively collected data, looking at nulliparous term singleton vertex at plus two station. And they were classified by what was attempted, regardless of what they ended up in. And they found that compared to a C-section, operative delivery resulted in a lower rate of infection without a significant difference in the remainder of outcomes. And I will note, and you just look at these odds ratios, we're not kind of used to looking at them upside down, sort of in the uh, negative, but it's akin to a 25 times magnitude difference for probability of an infection. And then the Consortium on Safe Labor again makes another appearance here. So this is the group we talked about earlier, um, which included 19 hospitals, including us. And they had exceptional success rates once somebody got to complete in plus two station, close to 99% for each. Importantly, again, no difference in this time in maternal morbidity, but actually improved neonatal outcome with forceps over a cesarean delivery. So speaking of neonates, this will bring us to our next topic, um, which is neonatal risks. And I'd say this is sort of the other half of the risk discussion. And it's really um, for these divided by type of operative delivery. I'm going to focus mainly on the extra intracranial hemorrhage since the remainder of these are thankfully uh, much less common. So first, starting with Kappa. So this is why I make those striped little hats, right? So this is just a very superficial on the skin level and the subcutaneous tissue full of serous inguinous fluid. It's molding. It's going to go away on its own in a few days. Cephalohematoma is slightly more common or not more common, but slightly more concerning. This represents rupture of vessels between the periosteum above and the skull on the inside. Usually these are parietal, and the resolution of this hematoma, though, can lead to some degree of hyperbilirubinemia. Because, though, it's restricted to the sutures, you can see the little dotted line there, um, they're usually uh, relatively benign. Subgalials, of course, are the big scary thing. So this is like a fluctuant, boggy thing. It's going to cross the suture lines, and because it can cross the suture lines, um, you can lose a tremendous amount of blood um, very quickly um, for the baby. In fact, it was the subgalial that back in the uh, 90s um, led to 12 deaths, nine serious injuries, and it was the reason the FDA actually has this um, specific um, memo out there regarding um, operative deliveries. But I would make the suggestion that while all of that sounds scary, 
when we consider any of these, we should really consider who is the control group. And so this is kind of the study looking at that. It's been referenced like over 600 times in PubMed. It's published in New England Journal. And it was local again. So it was a California database from 92 to 94, looking at um, upwards of half a million deliveries. Of these, about half of them were um, normal deliveries. Um, about 20% were C-section. And the rest were some sort of an operative delivery, which of course is very different from our numbers these days, but um, also including sequential. And these are the results. So I'm going to start by actually leaving out the death column because, as you can see, thankfully, really no significant difference, and it's really rare. So I'm going to use intracranial hemorrhage then as our surrogate endpoint, and in the context of operative delivery, it's also the one that's the most relevant. So what you find then is that the sort of optimal outcome, uh, you know, ranked sort of top to bottom there, is to have um, a, not, a normal vaginal delivery or an unlabored C-section. There is an increase in intracranial hemorrhage compared to those with whoops forceps or a vacuum delivery, but importantly, again, it is no different from the unscheduled C-section after labor, sort of one in the several hundreds amount. And subsequent studies have shown similar findings. So suggesting that really when the right control group is chosen, there's minimal increased risk to the neonate, even among the more common outcomes, for example, intracranial hemorrhage. But how about in the long term? So this is one of my favorite historical studies, and I'll kind of highlight my, my favorite spot there. Coffee break. So I always wait for the thank you note for my four steps 18 years later, but I haven't gotten to anything. It's fine. So as you can see, um, though, um, when we look at really the real long-term outcomes here, um, most have no difference, even among the things that we potentially worry about, right? So we worry all the time about this sort of retinal injury, corneal abrasions, um, bleeds, et cetera, and those that you would expect to be related to that, i.e. vision problems or hearing tests or differential um, neurodevelopment, um, they're really absent. This Olberg study, I bold only because it's the only one of any long-term studies that I could find that actually did show a difference. Um, but if anything, this is sort of an exercise in if you have enough big, a big enough population in Sweden uh, and you test on a fine enough number, specifically math can range anywhere from um, 100 to 300 their scores. Um, vacuum had a one point difference in um, um, GP or math scores compared to uh, normal delivery. So an exercise in how to get a positive abstract finding. All right, so the risk benefit summary, we kind of already talked about the maternal risk, and now with some new MFMU consortium studies, we may say that there has potential for even benefit. And then neonatal, probably short-term increased risk of ICH, but not when compared to um, the labor patient that converts to a C-section, which I always think of as really, that's what you're picking between, right? So um, the, um, the risk there is really minimal and that the, we don't really see any long-term sequelae. So then I'm gonna round out actually here with the question that we sort of started with of where are we going? And I would suggest that this very much uh, depends on us. Uh, and this was sort of a position statement put out by Schaefer and Coy um, back in 07 that said in much the same way as we would not feel comfortable sending out our residents only capable of doing a laparotomy and not a laparoscopy or radiology residents able to read MRIs but not CTs, I believe we must have the same commitment to giving them tools for operative delivery. So that was then, how are we doing now? Well, this is our current landscape and this is the most recent survey specific to forceps delivery performed out of UCLA actually. And I have to say, it's honestly a really difficult to read graphic, but in summary, anywhere from only one to 26 percent um, feel comfortable to perform a forceps independently but importantly 25 to 34 percent would perform them with help suggesting that we can all be helpers here and really even a small change can make a big difference so in this study out of ucsd the addition of a single faculty proactively teaching forceps over vacuum resulted in an increase in forceps and importantly, without a subsequent increase in complications, only a 3% third or fourth rate. And this is not an insurmountable hill. So even just getting to a median of eight deliveries at graduation gets you to the point, as they showed in this Northwestern study, of having no increase in complications over more experienced docs. And importantly, another study showed that if we can get people to at least 13, um, then they are 95% likely to continue using them after delivery. And then the last important point here to remember about this overall trend is that it goes very much beyond the hospital walls. 
So as we become less comfortable with this tool, so too do our patients. And this is a questionnaire out of the University of Kansas. And what they found was that only 40% of patients thought that um, forceps should still be used. And they were more likely to feel that way, um, fortunately, if they were uh, white post-college or greater than 40 years old. In other words, three North. So I do believe that we can do it much in the same way that I believed I could make this graphic in Photoshop and it took way too much time, but it is going to take some work. So how do we do that work? So Yeoman sort of suggests that we do treat it like anything else. So we give lectures, we do exams, we do sim training. Um, and I always suggest to people that one of the greatest parts, you know, when they talk about this sort of applicate, uh, applying the instrument and doing the hand over hand pull is that the, the reality of forceps in particular is that you really haven't tried anything until you've successfully placed them, which is always the intimidating part for us, um, and pulled, right? Unlike a vacuum, once you've turned the suction on, you've turned the suction on, you're committed to a vacuum. But with forceps, if you start trying to place them and it doesn't feel great, um, or you don't really feel good about, you know, trying to pull with them, just abort and do something else. You can still do vacuum them because you haven't actually pulled. You just sort of sorted things out. Um, and so then in the vein of trying to kind of do my part, uh, this is a free article I wrote in some YouTube simulation videos um, with some of the practical tips and uh, pitfalls I've run into uh, teaching these uh, over the last decade. I think it's sort of a, um, I, don't know, I think I think they were they were fun to make and um, they um, really go through some of the little steps that can go wrong. Um, and one of my favorite parts is also sort of teaching these uh, to folks directly. So I'm happy to join anybody. Um, in the Sim Center, whether as you can see from Dr. Kong here, they would like to be there or not. <laughs> um, and I will also mention um, that it is not only for residents um, that I'm happy to do this. So um, back in 2015, I was offering teaching to um, attendings as well. Um, and you know that when the best among us uh, took me up on that, um, that you are very much in good company if you come hang out with me in the Sim Center. Because at the end of the day, Ultimately, operative delivery has been declining, um, especially forceps among those, but it is a really important skill. Um, and I would suggest ultimately in the end that where we go is up to us. And so then finally, sort of a last PSA, um, you know, if you ever need a truly dramatic quote, I always recommend going to young adult fiction because uh, they're just very dramatic and terminal. Um, so I do believe that we stand at a crossroads um, and I will, um, at this point, sort of thank you all for your attention uh, and take any questions. And then very last thing here is, um, as many of you know, I don't do reference lists because I think they're silly. Instead, I do big reference folders with a bunch of pre-downloaded PDFs. Um, so these are the um, links either via your phone or via the little URL at the bottom to the folder with all of these PDFs from the talk in it. And I added in the Grand Rounds attendance code uh, just for ultimate brownie points. Um, so thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Always an incredible speaker, amazing presentation. Uh, I don't know, did you answer the question in the chat box? Let's see. Let's see here. From Dr. Newman, is there any literature about fetal outcomes for neonates born vaginally after an attempted OVD, i.e. fetuses born after pushing continued versus those who went to section? So I've never seen the verses to that, and I hope to never see the verses to that. Um, and for the same uh, reason that we sort of talked about earlier, that like when you have committed to having a operative delivery, um, you and it doesn't work, then the answer is C-section. Um, and you do not resume pushing. We, I mean, we here locally had a horrible outcome um, because of that, but then also just, the potential risks have been incurred once you've most commonly in the case of applying a vacuum, once you've applied a vacuum um, and the delivery hasn't happened. Um, so um, I would recommend strongly against um, doing any sort of pushing after an operative delivery has been attempted. It's just time for C-section at that point. Thank you. I think we see it a more than you would expect. So I was hoping that someone had at least looked at fetal outcomes to help back up why we shouldn't do it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I saw it recently, which is why I decided to give this talk, actually. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Dr. Wong, either 
unmute or use the chat box. All right, if not, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Wong. Thanks, everyone.